snipers took aim and fired. It was random, unpredictable, frightening. They murdered 10 people and injured three more. Sure to terrorists, I mean, they terrorized the entire area. Killers and police began a bizarre dialogue. Chief Moose started using the media to send cryptic messages to the snipers. Call us at the number you provide. You think you've heard it all. But beyond the headlines, below the surface, there's much more. Wednesday, the 2nd of October, 2002, 6.04 p.m. In Montgomery County, Maryland, 55-year-old James Martin drives to this shop to buy groceries for his group at church. Just as he gets out of the car, a rifle shot whizzes through the air. Martin falls to the pavement dead. The shooting occurs 12 miles outside Washington, D.C., in Wheaton. The 3rd of October, 7.41 a.m., four miles from Wheaton in Rockville, Maryland. 39-year-old landscape gardener Sonny Buchanan is mowing the grass here along Huff Court. A single gunshot kills him. 8.12 a.m., five miles away in Aspen Hill. 54-year-old cab driver Prem Kumar Walakar is filling up his car at this petrol station. From out of nowhere, a bullet rips through his side. Within minutes, he is dead. 8.37 a.m., about two miles away in Silver Spring. Sarah Ramos, an immigrant from El Salvador, is sitting outside this post office. When a fatal shot strikes her in the head. 9.58 a.m., five and a half miles away in Kensington. A 25-year-old nanny, Laurie Rivera, is hoovering a car at this petrol station. Another single shot, another death. We follow developments in Montgomery County, a terrible murder rampage. In each of these five cases, the killer or killers strike, then vanish. How does someone kill in broad daylight without leaving a trace? It's as if a ghost was amongst us doing these things, because as we were rushing to one crime scene, one shooting scene, another one occurred. It is the bloodiest crime spree in the history of Montgomery County. Five dead in a 24-hour period. Later that morning, Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose calls a press conference. The police chief informs parents that schools are on code blue. Children will be kept indoors. Our schools are safe. Our children are safe at this point. What struck reporters immediately was the randomness of the killing and the circumstances in which people were being shot. I mean, they were pumping gas, vacuuming their car, cutting grass. The everydayness of this was scary. Many wonder, is there some connection among the victims? Police only have a few scraps of evidence. One witness says he heard a popping sound at the Silver Spring post office murder. That time when he turned, he saw what was a white box truck leave at what he described as a, a high rate of speed. Before the day is over, another murder, this time in Washington, D.C. 9.20 p.m. 72-year-old carpenter Pascal Charlot stands on this corner waiting to cross the road. Someone guns him down. Witnesses again hear the crack of a rifle shot, but see nothing. Publicly, authorities press their one strong lead. A white truck like this one. But after the Washington DC shooting, witnesses tell police they saw a different type of car. Chief Moose was asked, is there something to a report that we received from an eyewitness about a Caprice or a late model Caprice, a dark car? The police sort of knocked it down. And, uh, As a result, news reports barely mention the Caprice. Need information on the white police are truck. again looking for a, a white vehicle. Van hunt, van hunt, if you will. In the hunt for a white box truck, do the authorities ignore other valuable clues? 
By now, the spate of attacks has left six dead in less than two days. Police have studied bullet evidence from all six. They conclude that the bullets came from a single weapon, a 223 calibre rifle like this one. It's capable of killing from several hundred yards. On the afternoon of the 4th of October, the killer or killers strike again. 2.30 p.m. In Fredericksburg, Virginia, 43-year-old mother of two, Caroline Sewell, is loading packages into her car outside this craft shop. She is shot and wounded. By now, hundreds of journalists are covering the unfolding tragedy. Parents demand to know what will be done to protect their children. School officials tighten security and cancel all outdoor activities. The weekend passes without incident. But when lessons resume, so does the shooting. Monday, the 7th of October, 8.09 a.m. In Bowie, Maryland, 13-year-old Iron Brown arrives here at the Benjamin Tasker Middle School. As he walks towards the building, a bullet strikes him in the abdomen, critically wounding him. The shooting of a school child seems like a direct response to Chief Moose's earlier assurances that children would be safe. Stepping over the line, shooting a kid, I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Boy is his victim. It is a chilling case. The timing of the attack raises a new question. Is the sniper watching and responding to media reports? With the story gaining worldwide attention, journalists now launch their own investigations. The media started talking to the witnesses. They started pushing and they started to get leaks. Sources tell the media that the sniper has communicated with police. They leak word that in a wooded area about 150 yards from the school shooting, investigators found a tarot card, the so-called death card. On the back of the card is a taunting message. For you, Mr. Police. Code, call me God. Do not release to the press. The 9th of October, 2002, Washington, D.C. A local television station, WUSA Channel 9, is the first to report that the police have found the death car near one of the sniper shootings. Police were trying to keep this detail a secret. Police Chief Charles Moose is furious. We will have a vote. And if it's decided that Channel 9 is going to investigate this case, then so be it. The police chief appears to be losing control of his investigation. Someone with in-depth access to the case is leaking details to journalists. This raises the question, should news outlets broadcast confidential information during an unfolding murder spree? At this point, the media has little to go on. No description of a suspect, no composite sketch, no personality profile. So broadcasters begin to fill airtime with speculation rather than facts. The specter of terrorism was raised, but also the idea, is this some kind of loner, some kind of madman? Is this somebody who was ex-military? Journalists interview criminal profilers who are not involved in the investigation. These experts spout theories about what kind of person might be responsible for the shootings. A white man, white male, mid-30s, that was the profile of the kind of person that could do this kind of random shooting. Why are criminal profilers convinced that the sniper is a white male? Whoever it is, they have not finished killing. The 9th of October, 8.18 p.m. On his way home from work, civil engineer Dean Myers is filling up his car at a petrol station in Manassas, Virginia. A single gunshot to the head kills him. The 11th of October, 9.30 a.m., 53-year-old father of six, Kenneth Bridges, is shot dead here at another petrol station near Massaponics, Virginia. The 14th of October, 9.15 p.m., Falls Church, Virginia. The sniper kills 47-year-old FBI analyst Linda Franklin outside this Home Depot shop. 
The death toll so far, nine people dead and two injured, all within this 40 mile radius. No one feels safe in public areas. Petrol stations put up tarpaulins to conceal their customers. Some people crouch or bend over while pumping petrol. Others wait in their cars. Five days pass without a shooting. Perhaps the killer or killers have moved on. Then, the 19th of October, 7.59 p.m., Ashland, Virginia. The sniper critically wounds a man outside this Ponderosa steakhouse. The next night at a news conference, Chief Moose makes it clear something has changed. He is now speaking, not just to journalists, but through them. To the person who left us a message at the Ponderosa last night, you gave us a telephone number. We do want to talk to you. Call us at the number you provided. He was developing a dialogue through the media with the snipers. The 21st of October, a man claiming to be the sniper contacts police from a phone box. The person you called could not hear everything that you said. The audio was unclear and we want to get it right. Call us back so that we can clearly understand. The sniper's response is to kill again. The 22nd of October, 5.55 a.m., Aspen Hill, Maryland. 35-year-old bus driver Conrad Johnson is standing in the doorway of his vehicle at the start of his shift. A fatal shot rips through his chest. The sniper has now killed 10 people and seriously wounded three, all in less than three weeks. Police sources tell journalists that the message left by the killer after the Ponderosa shooting was in the form of a letter nailed to a tree. There are rumors that it contained a threat to children. When pressed for details, the police chief confirms this. He quotes from the letter. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. Police insiders also leaked to journalists that the Ponderosa letter contained a demand for $10 million. In his next press conference, Moose responds to the sniper. We have researched the option you stated and found that it is not possible electronically to comply in the manner that you requested. Why does Chief Moose negotiate with the sniper in public? The day after the bus driver shooting, there's yet another police leak to the media. Tonight, a search in Tacoma, Washington may be linked to the sniper. Journalists have learned of a new development, but this one is more than 2,000 miles away. Television cameras show federal agents digging up this back garden in Tacoma, Washington. It belongs to a man who, according to police sources, may have a connection to the sniper. Back in the Washington, D.C. area, journalists are also monitoring police radio bands. All of a sudden on our police scanner was a be on the lookout alert, and they give out a, a license tag number. And we're thinking, this is serious. The license plate is registered to a 1990 blue Chevrolet Caprice, the same type of car mentioned and dismissed earlier on in the investigation. The alert also includes the names of two men, John Allen Williams, also known as John Mohammed, and Lee Malvo. Sources are giving us the uh, name of the car that they are looking for in connection with these two people. It's a 1990 Chevy Caprice, blue and burgundy, they say, with New Jersey license tags, NDA21Z. That is the license. The broadcast could help catch the snipers, the or it could alert the fugitives to the fact that the hunt is on. Was it reckless to report this information without police approval? 11.50 p.m., Chief Moose releases a photograph of 41-year-old John Mohammed. Authorities are seeking him on a federal firearms charge. They believe he is traveling with a minor. The 24th of October, 12.45 a.m. Fridge repairman Whitney Donahue is driving home along a road called the I-70 near Frederick, Maryland, about 45 miles northwest of Washington, D.C. The authorities are looking nationwide for two individuals, one young man. He hears a news report describing the killer's vehicle, a caprice like the one he himself owns. He makes a mental note to keep an eye out for it. 
Donahue is tired and decides to take a break. He pulls into this lay-by. Then he sees it. A Chevy Caprice, a dark color with New Jersey license plates. Donahue slowly backs into a parking space and uses his mobile phone to call the police. A SWAT team made up of county, state and federal officers assembles and plans the arrest. 3.15 a.m. They storm the car, kick in the windows and drag two men from the vehicle. It appears the hunt for the DC sniper is over. We have very fast developing details on this fluid story. The men were found sleeping in the car and were arrested. Police identify the men as 41-year-old John Allen Muhammad and 17-year-old Lee Boyd Malvo. Police who have spent three weeks in terror want to know who are Muhammad and Malvo. Friends say the two suspects in the sniper shootings had a father-son relationship but weren't even related. Here's a look at the connection between And perhaps the biggest question of all, why did they kill? Coming next on The Final Report. The 24th of October, 2002. Federal authorities arrest two suspects in the DC sniper case. 41-year-old John Mohammed and 17-year-old Lee Malvo. The focus today is really on who's gonna prosecute this case. The 25th of October. It's less than 24 hours since the arrests. Already, prosecutors in Montgomery County, Maryland, and several Virginia counties begin to vie over who will prosecute Mohammed and Malvo. The Montgomery County State's Attorney came right out of the gate with charges. No one had more shootings and no one had a greater impact than the folks in Montgomery County. But the suspects were in federal custody at the time of their arrest. This means that the U.S. Attorney General, John Ashcroft, will decide. I consider the matters charged in the federal indictment today to be... Early in November 2002, atrocities. he announces that the two men will be tried first in Virginia. The state of Virginia has a new anti-terrorism law. Drafted after 9-11, it makes it a capital crime to kill in the course of trying to intimidate the public or influence the government. The sniper cases land on the desks of Virginia prosecutors Paul Ebert and Robert Horan. With Mohammed and Malvo under arrest, the killing spree ends. But the story is not over. There are many questions that need to be answered, beginning with, who are Mohammed and Malvo? The answers investigators discover is that they are two men who happen to share the same kinds of hatred. John Mohammed was born John Allen Williams in New Orleans on New Year's Eve in 1960. Married and divorced twice, he has four children. He serves nine years in the army, rises to the rank of sergeant and earns an expert marksman badge. During his time in the army, he shows a reckless, violent streak. Saudi Arabia, 1990. Mohammed is stationed here during the Gulf War. He allegedly tosses an incendiary grenade into a tent filled with soldiers, setting it on fire. He was alleged to have been attempted to rescue them, and that, that backfired on him, uh, and as a result of that, he was disciplined. Williams later claims that while he was in the brig, his army guards physically and psychologically abused him. In 1994, he receives an honorable discharge from the army. His second wife, Mildred, later tells a journalist that her husband returned from the Persian Gulf a different person. He was angry and bitter. She said, I didn't know this man. He didn't want anyone to become close to him. Soon after, Williams and his wife joined the Nation of Islam. It's an American religious organization that combines elements of traditional Islamic doctrine with black nationalism. The group's leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan, is known for his extremist views, including anti-Semitic and anti-white rhetoric. By 1994, Williams, his wife and their three children are living in Tacoma, Washington. He sets up a garage, but the business goes bust. With a partner, he then establishes a karate school, hoping to recruit Muslim students. It too fails. 
William's life is in a downward spiral. Late in 1999, he has a bitter breakup with his wife, Mildred. On the 27th of March, 2000, Mohammed collects his children from school and flies them to Antigua in the Caribbean. Local authorities suspect he's a con man who supports himself with various scams, including selling forged US travel documents. One of his customers in Antigua is a local woman. She emigrates to Florida, leaving behind her teenage son, Lee Malvo. After his mother leaves, Malvo moves in with John Williams and his children. The two men form a close bond. Malvo begins reading the Quran. I think Malvo was uh, very much taken with Mohammed. Mohammed had this image of really a tough guy. Been to war. He was a big time warrior. In 2001, Williams returns to the United States with his children and Malvo. When Williams' ex-wife discovers that he's back, she regains custody of their children. It's at this point investigators learn that John Williams legally changes his name to John Mohammed. He and Malvo drift around the country, claiming to be father and son. He became very anti-American. He felt like America had not treated him well and not treated his race well. There was evidence that when 9-11 occurred, he felt that America got what it deserved. Prosecutors say Lee Malvo told a jail guard that he and Mohammed chose Montgomery County, Maryland for most of the killings because he said that's where the rich people lived. He hoped the murder spree would terrorize the community. Malvo admitted that he hated white people because he felt they had tried to injure the Nation of Islam's leader, Louis Farrakhan. Whatever their motivation, the snipers managed to murder 10 people in public places. How could the two men kill in broad daylight without leaving a trace? Prosecutors believe careful organization and planning allowed Mohammed and Malvo to scout locations and stalk their prey. Our car had been altered to become a really what we call a killing machine. Inside Mohammed's Chevy Caprice, police find this global positioning system used to plot their getaways. These local maps, which mark their targets, and this laptop for keeping track of the killings. The rear seat is loosened to provide access to the boot. There's a slot cut here, just above the license plate. It's big enough for the barrel of a rifle. Someone shooting can scramble from the back seat to the boot, mark his target through the slot, and fire without being seen. After his arrest, Malvo told his interrogators he would curl up like a spare tire after taking a shot. The aging car gave the men a platform from which to find their target, shoot and escape without arousing suspicion. Malvo constantly talked about the necessity of a team. You work together. One man spots, the other man shoots. We felt it from the circumstantial evidence that Muhammad perhaps was the so-called captain of the killing team. The murders left many people in the region wondering if there was a pattern to the killings. Was there any connection among the victims? The answer is no. Police Chief Charles Moose, now retired, tells the final report that investigators spent a lot of time looking for a connection. We're thinking, well, whoever's doing this must be doing it for some reason, and you try to look for that connection to lead us hopefully back to the uh, perpetrator. But even then, we find out there really is no connection. Prosecutors say Mohammed and Malvo carefully selected their shooting locations finding vantage points that allowed maximum concealment and fast escape. Forensic tests show that the rifle found in the car is the murder weapon. The snipers used this Bushmaster XM-15, a rifle that fires two .223 caliber rounds. The military-style weapon is known for its accuracy and power. In the Caprice, police also find a silencer that dampens the sound of a gunshot. For the public, seeing the suspects in custody was a great relief. It was also puzzling. 
For three weeks, investigators and journalists led the public to assume that the killers had been driving and shooting from a white truck. Police spent countless hours investigating this lead. In the hunt for a white truck, were other clues ignored? The answer, yes, by both the police and the media. Initially, journalists had only one angle to pursue, the white truck. As an Isuzu box truck. And the media, because we were all looking for new information, something to help the public, immediately latched on to that. Police officials tell the final report that during their investigation, they warned journalists that no one had actually seen a shot fired from a white truck. But it's the kind of vehicle police repeatedly told journalists that they were looking for. So naturally, the media focused the public's attention on that, and not the Caprice. The white box truck turned out to be the best disguise those snipers could have ever hoped for. In fact, police encountered the suspects and their dark blue Chevy Caprice several times during the investigation. For example, after the school shooting, a Baltimore police officer came across John Mohammed sleeping in the Caprice. So he kind of knocked on the window and spoke to Mohammed, saw his identification, had no reason to arrest him, really just checked to see what are you doing. And he said he had been traveling or whatever and he was taking a rest. The officer found no evidence of a crime, nor did police in several other instances. The people that, after the fact, said, well, they were here on this day and you missed them, and they were here this day and you talked to them, you know, those are very painful things to have pointed out. The police involved followed all of the constitutional rights that those people deserve and sent them on their way. Throughout the three-week investigation, criminal profilers on television repeatedly speculated about what type of person could commit such horrible crimes. They believed the killer was most likely to be a white man aged between 20 and 40. Why did the criminal profilers believe a white man was the sniper? The answer is simple. Statistics. 80% of serial killers, men like John Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Ted Bundy are white men. Most are in their 20s and 30s. Investigators tell the final report that the media speculation about a white man in a white van hampered the public's ability to be good eyewitnesses. The self-proclaimed experts said, all my information is it has to be a white male that would do this kind of thing. And we, what we found is the public would start to believe what they were saying. And they would start to wonder this is what I should look for. Chief Moose says the FBI also prepared a profile. It too concluded that the killer or killers were most likely to be white. Authorities also considered the possibility that it was a team, a man and a woman, with the man in charge. We thought, well, if it's two men, uh, they'll be too busy fighting over which one pulls the trigger. The authorities never had enough confidence in their portrait of the killer to release it to the public. For us to put a profile out in this case would have been irresponsible. We were not going to put any information out there that we couldn't back up. A Rambo wannabe or even somebody... However, broadcasters are under no such restrictions. They do have some responsibility for how the public perceives it, how they react. And speculating in this case was incredibly harmful and I think it hurt their credibility to some degree. Everybody is nervous, um, but we are responding to those fears. Chief Moose wonders if all the media speculation affected his own investigators. Did police officers, witnesses listen to the talking heads in the sense of it's a white male and just look right at Malvo and Muhammad but didn't see him? Some of these things we'll never know. As news reports kept on describing the probable suspect as a white man driving a white truck, the real killers, two black men in a dark Chevy, closely monitored the coverage. And they seemed to enjoy the terror that they were creating. The 3rd of October, 2002. Our schools are safe. Our children are safe at this point. Only four days after Chief Moose made his pronouncement, the DC sniper shot and critically wounded 13-year-old Iron Brown 
outside a school in Maryland. At that time, many asked the question, were the snipers watching and responding to media reports about the case? The answer is yes. It's clear from the evidence they watched the television. We have videos of him watching television in a restaurant. We're very interested in what was being said. After we aired the story about children being safe at school, he shot a child at school. After we aired the story about um, pumping your gas, I mean within hours, he shot somebody pumping gas. Personally, as a reporter, it made my blood run cold. In fact, the killers left a taunting message on a tarot card after wounding the young boy. The tarot card had our first opportunity to try to communicate with whoever was doing this. In responding, Moose tried to draw the sniper into a dialogue. He referred to the tarot card's call me God statement. I hope to God that someday we'll know why all of this occurred. Here the school shooting scene. Then the media revealed the existence of the killer's coded message. The controversy raised the question, should news outlets broadcast confidential information during an unfolding murder spree? The answer is, it depends. The journalists feel they acted properly in the public's best interest. In some concrete piece of evidence, I think that you can make the case that putting out that information might have been a public service. I know that the task force had a fit and was pretty angry, but someone involved in that investigation wanted that information out because there's only one way that got out, and that's if someone leaked it. But authorities insist that journalists and their sources were jeopardizing the only link to the killers. Leaks are a part of the business. But in a case like this, where there's a message, do not release this to the press, someone intentionally did it, it bothered me deeply. Confronted with the leak, Chief Moose appeared to be angry with reporters. So I beg of the media, let us do our job. But his public response had a hidden purpose. They will call today. The anger certainly is designed to say to the perpetrator, we're trying to work with you here. We want to stop people from dying. Soon, Moose is communicating openly with the snipers. We have researched the option you stated. Call us at the number you provided. This raises the question, why did Chief Moose negotiate with the snipers in public? The answer, according to the chief, is that this strategy increased the odds of catching the snipers. We were always hopeful that through communication, we would be able to solve the case, we would be able to uh, stop some of the killing, we would be able to eventually take them into custody. In fact, for several days, Lee Malvo had tried to get the attention of the authorities. He called police on the 15th of October, sounding almost desperate to prove he was one of the killers. We have called you three times before, trying to set up negotiations. We've got no response. People have died. Sir, I need get to report you to that Montgomery County Police Hotline. We're not investigating the crime. Would you like the number? Three days later, Malvo appeared outraged when he finally got through to Officer Derek Belisles. The male voice on the other end said, shut up and listen. I've got some information for you and don't ask any questions. He proceeded to tell me that he knew who our snipers were, but wanted to know what we knew about a shooting that had occurred in Montgomery, Alabama. Belisles immediately contacted authorities in Alabama. He discovered that there had been a fatal sniper-style shooting there the previous month. Investigators reviewed evidence from the Alabama murder. The snipers, meanwhile, continued to stalk their prey. The 19th of October, they seriously wounded a man outside the Ponderosa Steakhouse in Ashland, Virginia. The 22nd of October, they killed a bus driver in Aspen Hill, Maryland. By then, investigators had matched a fingerprint found at the scene of the Alabama shooting to Lee Malvo's immigration records. At about the same time, the FBI interviewed a man in Tacoma who had called the FBI hotline. He had told them about an old army friend who had stayed at his home with a Jamaican teenager. The guest's name was John Mohammed. Mohammed had referred to the younger man as the sniper. The two spent time in the back garden test firing a Bushmaster rifle, the same weapon that the police had shown on the television. 
a team of investigators raced to Tacoma, hoping to discreetly search for evidence. This video, shot from a local news helicopter, shows how wrong they were. I saw that on TV. Could have fallen off our chair when we saw that. Says the agents were looking for bullets. I can't even describe the feeling that I had when I saw that. A computer search links Mohammed's name to a dark Chevy Caprice, the same type of car described early on in the investigation by eyewitnesses and publicly dismissed by the police. For the time being, the authorities do not tell reporters this new twist. They worry that if it becomes public, Mohammed and Malvo will go into hiding. Once again, the media are a step ahead. Journalists get a description of the suspect's car from listening to police radio bands. Was it reckless to broadcast this information without police approval? In fact, it could have been disastrous. The broadcast of the information does enable Whitney Donahue to identify the car and alert police. The license tag was publicized by the media, and it took 90 minutes after it became public for those two individuals to be found. I think that reveals the power of the publicity and the message. However, at this critical moment in the investigation, the report could have helped the snipers escape. What if the snipers, instead of being asleep in the car, had actually been awake, listening to the radio, driving, they hear the report, they ditch the car, they get another car, easily could have gone the other way. When the authorities arrest Mohammed and Malvo, they recover a wealth of evidence that connects the two men to the sniper murders. Now the investigation turns to what is perhaps the biggest mystery of all. Why did they kill? Coming next on The Final Report. Autumn 2003, Virginia. In separate courtrooms, John Mohammed and Lee Malvo go on trial for a murderous rampage that terrorized people in the area around Washington, D.C. for three weeks. Paul Ebert prosecutes 42-year-old John Mohammed. In a separate trial, Robert Horan tries 18-year-old Lee Malvo. The lawyers share a common strategy, to tell jurors that Mohammed was the controlling mastermind and that Malvo was his bright and willing accomplice. No question that Muhammad was a dominating figure in this killing team. But Malvo is an, is an individual much smarter, naturally smarter than John Muhammad. He's not only smart, but he's cunning. He's a thinker. As a matter of fact, I would estimate that most of the planning that was done in this case, in the locations where they did the shooting, he was the thinker behind most of those. According to the law in Virginia, prosecutors don't need to prove which man actually pulled the trigger. Legally, it doesn't make any difference uh, because they had to operate as a team. We felt that from the circumstantial evidence that Muhammad perhaps was the so-called captain of the killing team. As Horan and Ebert build largely circumstantial cases against Muhammad and Malvo, they begin to unravel the biggest mystery. Why did they kill? The answer, according to the prosecutors, is anger, greed, and revenge. It's likely that their killing spree actually began in Tacoma, Washington. The 16th of February, 2002. Prosecutors believe the teenaged Lee Malvo walked up to this house where he shot and killed 21-year-old Kenya Cook. They say Malvo did it on behalf of John Mohammed. The dead woman's aunt was a friend of Mohammed's ex-wife, Mildred, and took her side when the couple divorced. It was a bitter struggle in which Mohammed lost custody of their children. Afterwards, Mohammed allegedly called his wife an enemy and threatened to kill her. Mildred Mohammed moved to the Washington, D.C. area to get away from her ex-husband. I personally believe that he came to this area thinking he's going to kill his wife. But Robert Haran says several other factors motivated Mohammed and Malvo to launch their killing spree. They truly believed uh, that they could intimidate the government into giving them uh, millions of dollars. It is likely that they had hoped to extort money through terror. In his early conversations with police, Malvo also hinted at another motive. 
the young man claimed that he hated white people whom he felt had threatened Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan. Prosecutor Haran believes Malvo pulled the trigger for many of the killings, an instrument for the older man's anger. Early in 2002, Mohammed spent weeks training Malvo in sharpshooting techniques. The teenager was a naturally skilled marksman. Together, they turned this aging car into a killing machine. They scouted locations with good sight lines and then murdered people who simply had the misfortune to be there. Prosecutors say Malvo helped the older man keep track of the killings on this laptop and maps found in the car. I think they took a lot of pleasure in being snipers. They would even document that as they went along. Uh, and there's no question that they listened to the media, read the papers. They keyed on what the media said. The 17th of November, 2003. A jury convicts Mohammed of killing 53-year-old Dean Myers at a petrol station in Manassas, Virginia. One month later, on the 18th of December, another jury finds Malvo guilty of the murder of Linda Franklin outside a Home Depot shop. For his crime, Mohammed is sentenced to death. The jury sentences Lee Malvo to life in prison without the possibility of parole, in part because he was a juvenile at the time of the killings. The killing spree in the October of 2002 revealed how easy it is for two men with few resources to terrorize an entire region. Now, the final report. We examine the actions of those involved in the DC sniper case. First, the killers. What began as revenge on Mohammed's ex-wife evolved into an extortion plot, fueled by racial hatred, anger towards the government, and a need for recognition. Mohammed has carefully avoided saying anything that would explain his motivations. Lee Malvo has recanted earlier statements to police. It's clear that the killers had a twisted relationship. Mohammed was an angry father who had lost custody of his children. Malvo was a boy without a father. Their relationship became an exercise in dominance and hero worship. With Malvo by his side, Mohammed found an opportunity to act out his murderous rage. In the final analysis, both the law enforcement authorities and the media made mistakes. The intense focus on the white truck by both the police and the media did hamper the investigation. In fact, it provided cover for the killers and may have led to dismissing reports of the Chevy Caprice. Profiles of likely suspects broadcast by the media may also have misled the public. They probably prevented good eyewitness reports. The relationship between the police and the media is always a delicate balance. Each side wants to use the other to its own benefit. The DC sniper case was unique. The killers followed the case by watching news reports. The police communicated with them through messages delivered on television. As for the police leaks, while reporters refused to reveal their sources, it seems likely that they were police officials who were critical of how Chief Moose was handling the case. In any event, journalists insist the leaks did nothing to hurt the investigation. They also point out that the broadcast of police information about the sniper's car led to their arrest. The DC sniper's case tested the relationship between the police and the news media. This was a crime, the proportion of which no one had ever seen. It was random, it was unpredictable, it was frightening to an entire region. Two years after the sniper's rampage, this memorial was dedicated to the victims. It stands here in the rolling hills of Wheaton, Maryland, where the first murder occurred. For many who live and work near Washington, D.C., the harrowing events of October 2002 are seared forever in their memories. It's like 
the fear I've never seen before. For those three weeks, two snipers held millions in the grip of terror. Dogged police work and not a little luck brought the killing to an end. But the DC sniper case reveals how vulnerable we are to people fueled by hate.